around. Uh, Mr. Como began surveying in 1974 with his father, Paul Como. Looking back, Tony's pretty sure his father broke every childhood uh, child labor law that was in effect at the time. Uh, the uncomfortable experience was what uh, created the bedrock foundation and what he uh, has been a long and exciting career. Uh, Mr. Como's work experience spans a wide spectrum, having both public sector and private sector experience, has worked on large multiple discipline engineering firm, and has been a sole proprietor and had his own business. Served as a project manager for the boundary and construction of the $55 million Cabo San Lucas golf course, which I was wondering if you got lifetime golf for that. <laughs> oh no, they don't let guys like us back in after they finish it. <laughs> has performed numerous lot surveys for private individuals throughout Southern California, has performed many other types of surveying. Uh, current role is project senior project surveyor for Stantec Consultants. Uh, after achieving California licensure in 1988, he began presenting workshops and seminars with Pacific Land Seminars. And since 1990, Mr. Como has presented with various topics throughout the Western United States. So without further ado, thank you, Mr. Tony, for presenting tonight. My pleasure. I'm glad to be a part of this. This is great. Um, I only recognized, I recognize two. I recognize you and, and Rich, um, but the, to the rest of you uh, men and women, I appreciate the fact that you're taking time out of your busy schedule at the end of a Monday to, uh, you know, to take part in this program. And I, I want to especially thank Trent for, for, uh, for bringing me into this program. You know, just a word about mentoring, um, you know, with all the sequestering we're going through now. Um, you know, we talk about this at our company a lot about the mentoring aspect of, of how our profession survives and hats off to Trent for getting this program off the ground and, and, and getting it up in the air. It seems to be doing really well. There's over a dozen of us here this afternoon. So um, I will do my best not to waste anybody's time for sure. Um, Trent, I'm going to assume that if I share my screen, I can start uh, having everybody look at my stuff. Yeah, you should be good now. I allowed everybody to share, so you should be good. Cool. Let's see here. All right. Uh, can everybody see the, uh, the little good. agenda here? Is that coming through? Yep, you're good. Oh, okay, great. And feel free to chime in if I get ahead of myself or anything. It's not a familiar format for me. But um, today, I want to talk about least squares adjustment using Starnet, um, uh, now microsurvey Starnet for quite a few years. Uh, and I want to talk about um, just the general importance of least squares adjustments and what we do. Um, it's the, the measurement analysis of what we do, I think separates us from the, the standard, the standard fare. Uh, so many people go out and just punch a button and accept the answer. And um, people like me and people like Rich and people like Dave Woolley and maybe some of you uh, generally follow up in court with those people um, and you know trying to find out what and where they fell off the standard of practice merry-go-round and it's usually really simple they didn't they didn't do any measurement analysis whatsoever um, and so Starnet allows us to do that um, very uh, very plainly um, I want to do a basic workflow on a project that we just completed in Idaho for Sturgeon Electric Company. Um, and, and then maybe we can take some Q&A or some refinement, or I'll be the first to admit it, uh, some advice uh, or some criticism, because there's, uh, like I said, there's 12 or 15 of us here. There's probably 16 or 17 ways to do this job. So uh, this is just one of them. Uh, I am not a geodesist. Uh, I have used Starnet since 1988 with great success. Um, but uh, again, I am not a practicing geodesist. I'm, I'm just an LS who happened to have a lot of experience at a company that relied very heavily on Starnet and uh, have come to use it as a pretty much a standard tool in, in the quiver, uh, if you will, for uh, many, many, many years. Um, the general importance of measurement analysis is often lost on, on most people. Um, they, they, again, it's become too easy to get an answer today. 
And I think, you know, probably many of you have come across surveys that you were given the idea that you could rely on, but you ended up not being able to rely on it. And it's probably because there was no measurement analysis involved. And um, the NSPS addresses this pretty, pretty succinctly in, in their standards, in their standard guidelines for an ALTA survey. Down here on section 3EV, 3E5, if you will, um, you know, they, they come up with this, this uh, measurement standard here, two centimeters plus 50 parts per million. Um, and, 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 and that's applied to, to what? I mean, what does that really mean? The absolute position of a point? Um, no, it doesn't mean that necessarily. It means the, the, the relative positional pos uh, precision uh, of a point or of a line between two points. And it, this section in the standards takes up a lot of calories uh, in, in, in talking about this relative positional precision uh, that they set a standard on. And they talk about the 90% confidence level. Um, they talk about some, some environmental and some, uh, some statistical factors that will affect this relative positional uh, precision. Um, but the bottom line is, in order for you to sign an ALTA survey, I, I don't see any way around of doing an adjustment with a least squares with a least squares adjustment package. How can you stand up in court and say that your survey answers the criteria for the measurement standards in in the ALTA standard guidelines um, without having put your survey through a rigorous adjustment? Um, analysis and 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 conclusions that you would draw from from uh, a least squares adjustment. I happen to be a favorite of Starnet. Um, I know there's a, a TBC camp and a Starnet camp, um, both both valid. Um, but again, just from familiarity, I've I've gotten somewhat familiar with with uh, with the Starnet adjustment. So I mean, kind of as an intro to why why least squares adjustment, um, really the only national standard that's published uh, basically says you can't sign one of their surveys unless you do a least squares adjustment. And I, that may come as a shock to some people, it may not, I hope it doesn't, but that's my interpretation of this. And certainly in the, in the Q and A, we can, uh, you know, we can, we can talk about that and, and, and others perceptions of, uh, of that. Um, this project that we did in Idaho was really interesting. Um, it was a 16 mile uh, pole layout, a pole about every 300 feet or so. There was about 300 poles. Uh, and it was through the middle of uh, a facility called the Idaho National Laboratory, which is a Department of Energy facility um, that they, um, they work on nuclear energy uh, solutions. Uh, it was very restricted. The access was very restricted. There was one road through the project uh, along the, the path of the, 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 the KMZ here that you see with the, with the pole locations on it. Um, it, was, it was very barren. Uh, it was very out in the middle of nowhere-ish. Um, and it was about a half a mile, just a minor point of interest from the site of one of the deadliest nuclear meltdowns in the United States history. Back in the 50s, there was a meltdown here at this plant when they were doing some research. And all the nuclear waste and the remains of the three people who perished are buried right here in this little filled in square of land. Um, and that was a half a mile away from our job. So the guys were real happy to hear about that. Um, but no, uh, no magnetometers were injured in the, in the process here. And so um, we got the uh, we got the task to lay out this this project, um, put these poles in, and um, one of the interesting things is in this project can and again I don't know the clarity of what we're looking at here, but can you all see the the red the red line I'm kind of tracing? Kent, can we? I mean Trent, can we yep. see that? Yep. Okay, yep, that's really that's that's going from one coordinate zone to another in Idaho. Um, and so one of our first issues was to determine 
you know, what the base mapping survey was done. And, and thankfully, they used all of the central zone. They didn't go into the east zone. And so we didn't have to fight two datums. Um, so we were happy about that. Um, but one of the one of the first things that I do on a on a project like this is I kind of get an idea of where some of the local uh, course locations are that are maintained and operating. And when I when I pan back here to the beautiful landscape of central Idaho, um, I can see several um, you know several course locations uh, that are that are pointed up. And there's only one that's relatively close to the project. Um, but what I do, um, you know, when I when I do the groundwork for a, a project like this that I know I'm going to use least squares on, is I'll I'll go into this this Google resource. It's not very sophisticated, but it's very comprehensive, and I check the data avail availability for a certain site, and we we see that this site hasn't updated in a day or two. But at the time in which we were doing the job, it 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 had been updating uh, every day, and then I'll go into the uh, further into the resource here, and um, you know, I can actually just download the data sheet for the point. Make sure that I've got good information that my epoch and 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 uh, and year are good here. The adjustment of the 2010, we're good there. And so I just kind of collect some source data and find out what's around there um, and. Uh, and kind of plan the observation times for the survey accordingly. Now, one of the things that we're faced with on, on jobs like this, and, and we happen to do a lot of remote work like this, is the fact that the control is really not very close to the job. Um, you'll see that this point right here is, is, a, is 15 kilometers away, but a couple of the points that we ended up using uh, were 90 kilometers away and 45 kilometers away, um, not super close, but not undoable with the right amount of observations. Um, I don't know about many of you, but I kind of have a rule of thumb about if a, if a control location is within uh, 15 to 20 kilometers, I'll figure I can get away with some 15 minute observations. If it's 20 to 50 kilometers away, I'm gonna use half hour observations. And if it's 50 to 100 kilometers away, I'm going to use hour-long observations um, when we get to the the actual boots on the ground uh, observing time. And we have had remarkable success um, with some of these long-distance control projects. I just picked this one because it's one of the more recent uh, recent projects that we did. But I'll I'll go ahead and uh, and um, download those data sheets. And uh, put those in a in a in a in a in a file directory. Uh, I'll have that information, you know, at the ready for when I'm ready to do my uh, when ready to do my adjustment, and uh, we can utilize that as a ready resource. All from all from resources that are available on on Google Maps, uh, Google Earth Pro, I should say. I'm sorry about that. Um, and so. The, the method that we use is a is a method that we came to be familiar with um, when working on a lot of Caltrans work in Southern California. Um, I don't and and Trent, you mentioned that there was some Caltrans people on the on the call today. Um, I've known Jay Satlich out of District Seven for I don't know thirty years, I think, and um, he's now the chief out there. But when he was uh, when he was head of the of the survey section out there. We did a lot of on-call work for him, and he introduced us to a method of surveying that was that's really become quite beneficial to us. And I'll I'll kind of introduce it to you in one form. And, and again, Q and A is going to be real interesting, I'm sure. Um, but it it has to do with um, multiple observations and sidereal separation. Now I know that there's a school of thought that says. Uh, we can pinwheel around a site and get one radial observation and, and, and we'll be good tying to local site control. Um, I haven't had that much luck with that, um, but, but I've had tremendous amount of luck with, um, with the, the method that we're about to, to talk about. Um, zooming back into the site, in this 16 mile site, um, we set up a, a, a scenario where we would put one, two, three, four, five control points down on the ground. 
and those control points um, were positioned roughly to never really be farther away than a mile and a half or two of, of any point on their particular reach. And so you can see from this second control point back to the angle point, it's about a mile and a half and kind of halfway to the next control point, it's about a mile and a half. Um, and, and so th this is kind of how we came up with the positioning of, uh, of where we would put our control points. And the guys got out to the site and um, got these positions, uh, you know, reconned and, and whatnot, basically using Google. Again, not using any serious navigation techniques, but basically using the KMZ that we provided and a latitude and longitude for the approximate location of the, uh, the future control points. And in a nutshell, um, what we did was nothing more than a series of hour long observations at each point, each control point, one, two, three, four, five, not really concerning ourselves with the connectivity between the two points, um, but really concerning ourselves with those hour long observations that we are going to use to adjust out to the out to the core stations that we have positions on and use some core stations that we don't have positions on simply as extra extra receivers, if you will, just to provide um, not to use the term in its pure fashion, but some redundant measurements, not ambiguous baselines, but just get some redundant baselines into the project. And so <clears throat> with the travel time and the dirt road and the access and the homeland security issues and whatnot of working on a federal site, uh, you know, the guys were able to accomplish this in two days. They would, they set up their base unit at one and set that to collect. And they drove on the dirt road up to unit two and set that second unit up and then drove back to the first point. And by the time they got back here, the unit at control point one had been burning for well over an hour. And so they would leapfrog over to control point three, they'd get that one going. By the time they got that one going and drove back to control point two, that one had been going for an hour, et, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There was no advanced mission planning other than to look at the statistics of the satellites and make sure we were gonna have good weather, um, satellite speaking. But as far as advanced mission planning or session coordination or, or anything like that, <clears throat> we did none of that. We had one vehicle and two units. Um, and, you know, it was two days for five points is kind of a long time, but given the nature of the site, the access issues we had and, and uh, the remoteness of the site, um, we, th we thought we did, uh, we thought we did a pretty good, we got, thought we came up with some pretty good timing on that. Um, forgive me, let me see if I can move, oh, there we go, I can move that, good, stand by one. So, <clears throat> I, I do use TBC for one function, and that is to, Rich, you're smiling, I see you, um, and that is to, to process my baselines out to the cores. I'm not going to belabor that. Um, that's a separate set of software. Um, I do a very minimal amount of, of, uh, of vetting in TBC. If I see there's some gross residuals on the baselines or some some solutions that just don't work. Um, if I have floater fixed, you know, obviously, I mean, if I have uh, anything but fixed solutions, I'll exclude those baselines. But barring any, um, you know, ionospheric catastrophe, we generally get some good data unless the core station itself lets us down. So I'll bring our, our TO2 files into TBC and I'll export um, the, uh, the, the GPS file with all the baselines in it from our observations. And the key point in the observations, um, when we do our second observation on each one of these control points, we use at least a two hour sidereal separation, um, which means for those of you who may or may not be familiar with that, if, if I take an observation on control point one at 10 o'clock in the morning, um, my second observation has to answer either one of these two criteria. It either needs to start after 12 o'clock the next day, 
or it has to end before eight o'clock in the morning the next day. As long as the sessions are clear by two hours. Um, is that a hard and fast rule? We make it a hard and fast rule to kind of take some of the subjectivity out of it. Um, I used to work for a guy named Bob Johnson and, and he was of the ilk that if, if you give a field guy any leeway, it's gonna come back messed up at least once. Um, and, and, and again, it, any of you men and women who work in the field, feel free to castigate me after the session here in the Q&A, but um, we like to cut the options and the, and the, op the, the if-then statements down to a minimum. So we run two, sep two sessions, um, preferably on two separate days with a sidereal separation of, of two hours. And bring that data into StarNet. And this is really the, the, the basic uh, basis of my, of my data file, my DAT file that I'm gonna run my adjustment with. And in pure Caltrans scenario, I'm gonna do a, an unconstrained adjustment here first. Um, for those of you who are familiar with StarNet, you will see that I have fixed in three dimensions, one of the three course points that I'm going to use. And I have given uh, a float of 100,000 feet in all three dimensions on the other two cores locations that I'm going to, to utilize. Um, in the uh, options file, I don't get too fancy. I make sure that I'm in the right zone. I make sure that I'm modeling with the correct file. And I work pretty much across the Western United States and I've developed a system. It's not real complicated, but um, on my desktop, I have the various geoids that I may have to work in and I'm, I'm working in geoid 18 now. Um, and so um, in that folder, uh, I have a diagram that shows me um, quite simply where I'm working in the United States dictates which bin file I use. And uh, I tend to work in this area and this area and this area and this area. So I keep this handy. Um, but I load the correct uh, geoid 18 file into, um, into StarNet and load my data and we'll see how it goes. Okay, so on an unconstrained adjustment, um, I notice with the standard uh, residual standard factors applied to the residuals that I come out looking way too good um, as more better than I should look. Um, what we want this error factor to, to, to normalize at is a one. Um, and so um, we'll go into some of the, the, the fine points of how to, how to, what to do first. But, but one of the primary things I wanna do now is I wanna weed out any bad vectors. This unconstrained adjustment is solely to test the integrity of the raw measurements that we've got based on the vectors we've measured. And so um, I come into StarNet, I come over to my observations and I look at my GPS vector residual summary. And in that summary, it shows me uh, a northing residual, an easting residual, uh, an up <laughs> residual, and a three-dimensional residual, which is obviously kind of a root mean square of, of those three elements there. And what I look for is I look for anything in the 3D over three centimeters, which roughly is about 16 or 17 hundredths. Um, this is the raw data that we measured and this is the raw residuals based on a minimum amount of constraints. I'm only holding one point. And, and, and in looking at the data in this column, it is exceptionally good. There's only one vector in here uh, that falls above what I would use as a threshold on any, any normal job. And so what I'll do is I'll go into my DAT file and I will, um, I'll comment out this vector. StarNet allows you to identify um, each of the vectors by a unique number. And so using the um, GPS ignore vector 92. Just going to run through this again, see if it changes any of the, of the answers here. 
Um, and, and by taking that one vector out, there's the worst offender. It's less than 16 hundredths. And remember, these vectors are, some of them are over 100 kilometers, you know, 60 miles long. So this simple, this simple inline command allows me to vet um, any bad data. Is it always this good? No. There's oftentimes um, a lot of bad data. But when we have a lot of redundant data, we can afford to lose some baselines and still maintain the integrity of, of having redundant baselines into, um, into the, the, the network control that, um, that we're running. So I've, I've, I've basically kind of vetted my data there. Um, and what I try to do is I try to leave, uh, I try to leave tracks on, on what I've done. And so in my data file, I will um, kind of leave some running notes. I'm doing a minimally, minimally constrained adjustment. I'm holding cores location IDNL fixed. Um, I've uh, ignored baseline um, due to uh, over uh, 0.163D residual. And, and that's great. That, that's what I've done here. I've, I've, I'm just kind of leaving some tracks in, uh, in, my, in, in, my, uh, in my data file. So anybody who comes back and looks at this can kind of see my thought process and what's happened. There's a lot more sophisticated ways to do this. Um, there's a couple of guys at our office that have some really great formatted dat data files. Um, I, I would suspect that, Rich, with your abilities, you know, your familiarity here, you've probably got some some good methodologies on this, but I just try to keep it simple and I just try to leave some tracks. I'm just a, just a simple surveyor and I don't want to confuse myself or anybody else. Um, at this point in the minimally constrained adjustment, I look at one other factor. I look at um, the values, uh, the, the difference in the, in the change for the, the two control points that I used but didn't hold. Um, this section in the in the listing file of Starnet coordinate changes from entered provisionals. Um, you can see in the DAT file that I've got point GTRG and point six eight one um, basically held free. I've given it a degrees of freedom of a hundred thousand feet in the X and the Y and the Z. Holding the one point IDNL and our raw measurement data we can see a very, very strong, great result um, in that holding the one point fixed, the raw data only changes those values by a couple of three hundredths um, in the northings and eastings, a, a thousandth, you know, eight thousandths. Um, and in the elevation, uh, you know, eight hundredths and, and, uh, and six hundredths. Um, and so just using the heights that were assigned to these points, um, we see that, that we're getting extremely good uh, agreement um, by holding one point and uh, vetting the raw data and taking a look at these, residual, uh, the, these, these residuals here from the enter provisionals. What tells me is I've, <laughs> through the grace of God, I've chosen the right three points to use um, because they seem, to be, uh, they seem to be doing really well. Um, you may notice in the sketch, it's, I, I, I generally work with three monitors, so forgive me if this is kind of small. I, I've got it compressed to one monitor. Um, but here's the initial network sketch. I've held point uh, IDNL and point P681 and point GTRG are the other two values that I have 2010 EPIC points for. Um, Point three P three fifty seven and P six seventy eight um, are points that I don't have two thousand ten values for, and uh, and six seventy nine. Um, but I'm going to use them. I'm going to use them as receivers in my adjustment to get redundant measurements in and out of my network. And that tactic, together with the sidereal separation and the sufficiently long um, observation times, uh, really, 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 really um, goes a long way toward getting you a good economic and efficient um, adjustment.
again, in order to, to, to kind of quantify how I'm proceeding with this, I'm just going to copy this part of the list file into my dat file. And I'm going to say to me or whoever comes after me, um, using this one point, I only had to vet one baseline. And my, the changes in my entered provisionals are exceptionally good. I've got extremely good agreement with the raw positions that we end up on these other two control points versus the published positions. And I, I think I'm going to end my, um, oh, I'm sorry, I got one more, I, I've got one more step. I want to, I want to provide some statistical information to bring this to bring this factor up into the into the one range on our on our 200 plus deltas, and we do that by supplying a, a factor, if you will, to the um, to the standard errors. Um, you'll notice that this error factor is is far less than one, and we want to bring it up to one. Just rule of thumb: if this number is less than one. Um, we want to make this number smaller. So let's let, let's do it like this. Let's do it like this. Let's uh, let's run it. Look at what happens this iteration. We bring it. I mean, just shooting from the hip. We bring it to almost in compliance with one. And I mean, you know, dirty little confession. This isn't a government job. This isn't a Caltrans job. I could spend another five minutes whittling this error factor down to 1.00. Um, but for the basis of what we're doing in, in my professional judgment, um, I think this is sufficient. So in the, uh, in the options that we've given it, we've provided a, um, a factor of two to the standard errors and a factor of two and a half to the vertical standard errors. And we've brought our, our, our un, unconstrained adjustment into a very nice statistical compliance um, by looking at the overall error factor being very, very close to one. And so um, I will bring some stuff in here. I'm not going to bring anything in here, but I'm going to put some more data on. I'm going to say that um, the uh, factor supplied uh, And, and again, I'm just using some shorthand here equals uh, error factor of 1.078. In other words, I applied these two factors in my GPS options. It brought my error factor down to a 1.078. And I'm going to say that done deal on the uh, minimally constrained adjustment. What I've done is I have vetted any bad baselines out. I've gotten great agreement with calculated positions for the other two course locations compared to their published locations. I've applied some statistical factors to the standard error factors. To, to bring my adjustment into alignment. And what I'm now going to do is I'll go to the constrained adjustment. Okay, and now I'm gonna constrain these other two control points, course locations. Hold them fixed in three dimensions. And what I'm looking for when I hit the button is this. What happens to this number? This number that we just achieved, which is very close to one, was basically holding one point fixed and letting the vetted raw data um, take its course. Now we're going to constrain it to two other control points. And hopefully this doesn't degrade um, and, and force some other, some other me measures that we may have to take. Um, so with that, we'll hit save, we'll run. 
And now you'll notice here that this number did not degrade uh, hardly at all. Um, this tells me that we have three fixed control locations that agree very well, obviously, with the data that we've provided in our in our adjustment. So I will um, I'll make a note to myself. Um, move to hold all three uh, cores locations fixed. I'll make a note to myself that the uh, error factor degraded to uh, 1.129, which is minimal. Um, and then I will go back into my options, see if I can fine tune this. Uh, that needs to get a, uh, this number needs to get a little smaller. So this number needs to get a little bigger. Let's see how that works. Save all the data. Okay, so with one correction, with with one correction in um, the GPS uh, statistical tab, we've brought this into a, a very good agreement here with with our target error factor of one. If this were a Caltrans project that needed extreme documentation, we would have whittled down the uh, unconstrained adjustment and then the constrained adjustment down to where these factors are one. Um, but again, um, we're looking good. We're looking good here in this, in this adjustment. And you can see here um, on the network sketch, P681 and GTRG are now held as fixed. And the other, uh, the other three cores locations uh, are still held free. They're not even in the adjustment. I'm just using these as auxiliary residual baselines to get redundant measurements into the points that we are trying to position. And you can see here um, into CP102, look at how much data there is in and out of this point. Yes, we have some connectivity to the, uh, to the neighboring control points. Um, in this situation, these are almost three miles apart. And so statistically, these are kind of fair game to leave in. If I was really a purist, I would take these baselines out as um, as redundant baselines in the in the vector scheme of things. Um, but I'm I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit and leave them in and let the connectivity add to the um, add to the strength of what we're what we're achieving here. Um, the end result is. A statistical set of coordinates here. Again, it's a little jumbled up, but here's our three um, station coordinate ellipses at 95%. Uh, here's our three fixed points. You can see these have obviously no error ellipses. Um, you can see the two, uh, two of the three unconstrained uh, course locations, three hundredths by one hundredth. Let me open this up a little bit and we'll get elevation by 1100 to be expected. Um, great horizontal uh, values on those, looking at the course points uh, kilometers away and then coming into the site, um, you know, control point 105, a couple hundreds by a hundredth, a couple hundred. It's, it, this is pretty standard accuracy across the five control points that we positioned. And then to be expected, a, a little bit more, a little bit more uh, uncertainty in the vertical, um, but without adhering to uh, NOAA 5859 standards of uh, multiple, multiple observations of three hours apiece, separated by two hours, and and all of the all of the observations are 100%, and 50% of them you have to observe twice, and some of them you have to observe three times which is not feasible for guys like us who are doing non-government work. You, you can't mount that kind of survey um, to, to get true two centimeter reliability on your elevations. Um, so in a nutshell, um, that, I mean, that's basically what I do. 
uh, on on a lot of different projects in in urban, in rural, um, in in <laughs> basically deserted areas like this one. Um, we we have gotten tremendous tremendous uh, results uh, from 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 utilizing this method. And um, when when our when our when our field guys come back uh, came back and did the layout on this project. Uh, you know they would they would run their RTK setups from these these control points, and from day to day they would check in to two or three points that they had already set from day to day, and just consistent check ins of, you know, a tenth, you know, five hundreds. Um, and uh, our client was looking for plus or minus three feet to put in uh, eight foot diameter steel power poles in. So we were able to, you know, deliver to our client. Um, you know, just a, an incredibly accurate survey, incredibly well-placed uh, uh, points for them to work off of. And we did 16 miles of these uh, polls, uh, including the control survey that took two days. I think this was a nine day effort. Um, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to, to Trent. Um, if I can figure out how to stop sharing my screen. Oh, there we go. Does it make sense for me to stop sharing, or you? Oh, uh, you can. You can okay. it up. It depends on what somebody's got. Yeah. Based on your presentation. Absolutely, but. absolutely. I hope this was useful and maybe shed some light on a on a method that that some of you may use, may not use, and and uh, and like I said, I'm not a geodesist. I'm uh, nor do I play one on TV. I'm just a just a surveyor who uh, likes to work out in the middle of nowhere and get some good results. I would say. Anybody got specific questions based on kind of what he's presented already? If not, I might go back to your original conversation about the Alta standards and how you're kind of applying it to uh, to your everyday work. You know, is it, are you doing static control on all of your boundary work or are you doing static control on a base in the parking lot? We, and then doing an R2K unit from there, or that's that's a, that's a great question, Trent, and I'm I'm glad you asked that. I I, I chose this humongous project um, because we got such good results, um, and and there was really no other way to do it. You know, the control was 30, 40, 50, 60 miles away. Um, yeah. But yeah, when when we do an ALTA or a record of survey or a, a, a survey for design purposes, aerial mapping. Um, Having cut my teeth in Southern California, where you know the prices of land are astronomical by any measure, I tend to use RTK sparingly, if at all. I mean, RTK is good for navigation to a point. Um, RTK is good to do rough grade, maybe. Uh, RTK is good to do volumes over a large surface when you're comparing. You know, you, maybe you've got a landfill project that you do this quarterly kind of deal or a mining project where you go out there every six months and, you know, you're looking for really large quantities. Um, but when, when it, I, I don't want to use the phrase whenever we can, it is standard practice for us to, to propose on a project with this exact scenario every time. Um, in Orange County, California, there's a there's a control point every half a mile, you know, uh, I mean, I, I may be overstating it a little bit, but, you know, there's a, a lot of control out there. Um, I'll use those points, um, but I'll still use this reaching out to the cores stations for redundant data, um, doing an unconstrained adjustment, holding one point fixed, vetting my data initially in TBC and then and then more more fine tooth comb in in Starnet. Um, this is this is how we do it. Um, now, uh, putting a proposal together for a 4600 acre ALTA outside of Yuma, um, you know, from one end of the site to the next, it's about five and a half miles. Um, we will certainly put two on site base stations. Uh, we will let those stations run continuously throughout the data collection process. Um, we'll do the same uh, scenario with hour-long observations separated by the two hours, you know, before or after the first observation. 
due to the sparseness of the cores locations down there, we will probably put uh, positions on those two base stations on site because of the fact that they're four or five miles apart um, and see how that works. If we can, if we can use those to as base stations to double determine the boundary points and the panels that we're putting down. Um, but, but this scenario is always my go-to, whether it's uh, a, a well monitoring job at the, at the corner Arco station or you know, a 16 mile pole line out in the middle of nowhere in South Central, in Central Idaho. Yeah, that's awesome. I know like, our rule of thumb is kind of that 15 minutes initially and then a minute per mile. On yeah, that. that's yeah. Kind of our rule of thumb to, to make sure we get an update on, on any static points that we do as well, so. Yeah. Good information, that's awesome. Somebody chimed in there a second ago. Richard, is that you? Hey, Todd, uh, it wasn't Rob, it Dylan. Go ahead, Rob. Hey, Rich. Good to see you, too. <laughs> I'll let you hit him up first, Rob. Go ahead. All right. Hey, Tony. Well, can you hear the, me? It's Rob McMillan. The one-two punch. I'm only sorry I can't see you. I know. <laughs> no, you're not. I got a face for radio. You got uh, a face for radio. I was going to say that. <laughs> so uh, uh, thanks for at least taking the time out of your busy schedule of the uh, jacuzzi at 41 Terravella <laughs> to join us tonight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that are on Facebook and have Tony in your in your circle, just about every post is uh, is a picture of his bubbling jacuzzi with a couple of glasses of champagne and some breakfast or something. Usually, uh, bacon of some sort. It's yeah. bacon, yeah. Who, bacon. You had me. You had me at bacon, Trent. That's it. <laughs> and uh, um, are you on your um, project down? Uh, the big Alta project, are you considering doing some kind of permanent mount that you can uh, use for your GPS base stations as, as uh, permanent control for the project ahead? I've done that in the past, uh, Rob. Um, we had, a, we had a, a, about a 90 mile aerial down in Ajo, Arizona, um, joining the the US Mexican border and there was very 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 little control and so we did do two permanent mounts we did a week's worth of cores observations to establish some positions on the permanent mounts um and we did utilize that um I, you know i think i think setting uh, uh you know some permanent control on this 4600 acre thing um, you know, that we'll be able to go back to, you know, two inch iron pipes, cement, you know, uh, witness paddles, you know, I think that'll be sufficient on this. Uh, plus, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing taller than a sagebrush or more durable than a cactus out there. So there's really not much to do as far as convenient permanent mounts, you know, um, but it certainly is a, a tactic that I've used before with great success. Yeah, if you do get this project, um, one of the districts in Caltrans was um, having a real good luck with uh, using a metal utility boxes that they could um, mount the antenna to a 5 8 11 threaded uh, brass bolt up through the top of the utility box and be able to put their equipment, their base station equipment in and um, along with uh, a car battery and mount a solar panel on the back side of the box for long for long duration projects where we didn't already have uh, network stations in the vicinity. Um, yeah, that's that's a great deal if you've if you've got I mean, I mean the resources to do that. It's a it's a fantastic a fantastic tactic, if you will. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean we've we've done um, we've done derivations of that. Uh, you know, back in my previous iterations in Southern California. Um, but yeah, the, the, anything, you know, when you know you're going to be going back to a project, anything to streamline and make it efficient and make it repeatable and reliable, um, anything along those lines is, is always a good thing to think about. Well, thanks for being here, Tony. I'm great to see you. Hey, Rob, good hearing your voice, buddy. I'm going to come visit you in person one of these days. 
Well, if you make it on a weekend, we'll serve you breakfast in the hot tub. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Tony, it's Rich. Um, great job. Uh, I feel like, like you said, this is the type of the way you should do your project from the smallest well survey to the biggest ALTA survey. This is really nice. Um, just a couple of curiosity questions for you. Uh, the first one is probably because you've been using Starnet for 30 years and some of the commands are, are different these days, but is there a difference between putting in a provisional symbol like an asterisk and putting in like 1000 feet for when you um, have your constraints in there? I, you know what, and, and, and this is a, a, a Roger Frank uh, thing. Um, he always preferred the g give it a hundred thousand feet of uncertainty rather than just putting the provisional asterisk in it. I, I, and it's just a habit. Um, and, and you bring up a good point, Rich. I mean, I've been using this since 1988. And there's a lot of things that I, t I take for granted in how I do things and probably how I explained them this afternoon, this evening. Um, but I, I will I will tend to um, what, what Rich is talking about here was when we were looking at these uncertainties here, I put 100,000 feet in each in each of the X, Y and Z factors. I just do that as a point of habit. Um, you know, you know, Rich, it's like when you try to fix an angle at 90 degrees or 180 degrees, it doesn't always like it when you fix it. But if you give it a thousandth of a second of uncertainty, it'll hold it at 180, but it won't choke up on itself. You, If you give, I mean, Starnet loves redundancy, but it doesn't like to be too constrained. And so if you give it too many levels of freedom or too many levels of restriction, it gets kind of balled up. Okay, I, and there's it does act funny in some sense, instances, and I wondered if that was something along those lines. So it's something to keep in my pocket to think about because just by default, you know, I, I did start using it a lot later. I would have put the asterisk there. I was wondering if you'd see something different. So that's cool. Um, you might have to keep asking a few questions. Oh, I'm afraid. To, I'm afraid you will, Rich. <laughs> no, no, they're, they're just no. You put your, you, you and Roger. The reason I use Starnet and learned it from you guys. So um, let's see. Uh, error factor. So you, I noticed you had a, a reference factor of, um, f or a scaler of five. Would that, would, if that was your default uh, scaler based on experience, like your typical a priori error, um, would you always bring that down just because in a particular survey you saw that the, the resulting reference factor was less than one? The reason I ask this is because after a long time of developing and where we think the surveys are going to be, if we see a condition where it's less than one, I tend not to scale down because I don't think I'm going to be better than the equipment or my experience is on most projects. I kind of think usually maybe I'm not seeing enough redundancy in that particular case. So I don't want to overestimate that I'm doing better than I am. Right. I mean, what we saw when we started here was, I, I think it was, I think it was, it, it may be what Starnet starts with was, was five. Okay. And that, that and was the question. Like, was that, was that your number or was that no. another? No. Okay. That, no. that would change it. Cause I'm seeing people take that one, that default one and start scaling at less than one. And now you're starting to say you're better than the manufacturer's, you know, specifications for the equipment. And I start questioning that. 100% agreed. Any, you know, when you set up, when you set up your defaults and again, we can, you know, we can look at this. Um, a, a lot of this is just the, the traditional defaults, but when, when you start seeing, a number less than one here, whether you're doing a traditional adjustment or strictly a GPS adjustment, you're kidding yourself. I couldn't agree more. You, you okay. can't get, you can't do that. You know, this is, this is where you want to end up. Um, one of my employees brought up a really good point. Um, like you, the GPS residual summary table is my go-to table. I've always got to make sure that's turned on. It's the first thing I go to. But he brought up a good point, and he said that before we start kicking observations out just because they have a larger number in that table, that we really should go back up and look at the, um, the other view, which gives us the standardized errors, so we could see if that value is actually within expectation. Because just because right. it's a physical value, it may not fall outside of our statistical, you know, expectation of what that measure might have, whether it's conditions or distance, you know, length of line. Exactly, exactly. You, you could have distance, you could have some localized ionospheric stuff, you could have multi-path, you know, you could have a lot of different things that affect. And and yes, I, I if I had a lot of, it, it, again, 
you hit it on the head. I take a lot of things for granted. Um, if if I come into this adjust, if I come into this analysis, and I have a bunch of 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 data that's not that's not good. I mean, I'm going to have one of two things. One of several things could be wrong. Yes, I need to come back up here and and get in here and look at the standard residuals. Eh, we've got an outlier here. I'm I'm looking through Rich and I don't see any other big offenders, you know, in this in this area. And so I feel I feel comfortable that if I just weed out anything that's over 15 or 16 hundredths, I, I, I choose this five centimeter, you know, reliability. Um, uh, and I have very little of that data um, uh, that goes bad. I'm, I'm in good shape. I mean, I, it's not uncommon, you know, you've got 207 vectors that we're looking at. It's not uncommon to have seven, eight, 10% data that you could, that you need to vet and that you need to get out. But if you have a plethora of redundant data, you can take some of these baselines out and still have plenty of redundant measurements into the, the points that you're trying to establish. Yeah, and you bring up a good point. Coming back to that that other summary is is probably good because even something like, you know, a tenth there, depending on how varied your survey is, but that might actually be out of tolerance and have a higher standardized error than the 1700s. Yeah, yeah. Depending it's, on the geometry of your of your network. Exactly. It's a it's a very it's a it's a very uh, you know it's kind of a balancing act. I I picked this one um, just because it it did it did work out really well. Um, it, it is something that we did um, really recently. And one other thing that I normally do is I normally check the connections. I, I check the, the integrity of the connections. This is another option that you can put in where I, I give it a centimeter, roughly, and I give it a parts per million, and I tell it to check. Don't just show me the ones that failed. But show me the show me the statistic for all of the connections, and this is another error propagation tool that you can use. So when we run it again, we come down here to this positional check. So this is each connection in our network, and this is the actual uh, adjustment to the baseline. And by that statistic I just put in, this is the allowable adjustment to the baseline. And so just, just reading from left to right, in this 17,000 foot distance, it had a approximate two hundredths of a residual in the baseline. We gave it some parameters up here that said, well, you're allowed five hundredths. So therefore your actual, as compared to your allowed, you only used 40% of, of, of what you thought you could do. What, what you yeah. thought you could do. Let me ask you, Tony, uh, we don't do a lot of AOTA surveys. We're in a different market, but isn't this tool in StarNet like just really made for you to do the check of those connections for an AOTA survey so you can certify that statement you brought up earlier? Isn't this like the perfect tool for that? 100%. Okay. This, I this, you... is, this is literally what that section in the standards is asking you. Mm -hmm. Can you certify that your connections are better than the, Seven hundredths and fifty parts per million. Now, if you'll notice, I used three hundredths and one part per million as my as my sieve, if you will. You know, <laughs> and so you know, you could you could go back there and and um, and say, all right, let's uh, let's let's go ALTA on it. What would Gary Kent say, right? We, we all need a bracelet that says that. What would Gary Kent say? Seven hundreds and fifty parts per million. This is the ALTA standard right here. If we do this adjustment again, and we say, hey, um, <laughs> based on the, the ALTA standards, that baseline could have up to 93 hundreds in a residual. We only had two hundredths. We only used two percent of the allowable residual. Now, I get it. These these baselines are are hundreds of thousands of feet long. This isn't your ALTA type of measurement, you know. But this is this is that this is that scorecard, Rich. Does yeah. the, can I sign this ALTA? Yes, I can. 
I thought it'd be, I thought it was just good to point that out because you were bringing in the ALTA specifications and this is a great tool for that. Yeah. Um, can I get you a couple more thoughts? Hey man. All right. You brought up uh, Mr. Sadelich, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for many years and I've done a number of um, surveys for the DOT and, and learned a lot from him over the years. What are your thoughts about GPS transformations and what, why would you choose not to use a transformation in this case for this survey? You know, one of the things that Jay um, does do a lot on, and let's 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 go in there to let's go in there and see if we can find it. Where the heck is it? Uh, your options, you mean? Do, where you select to turn it on? Yeah, we're gonna go over here and because yep. uh, this is this is how this is how rare I use it. There um, it is. What Rich is talking about here is. Are, are we going to use any of these transformation uh, paradigms? Um, and one of the things that Jay does is he he's constantly trying to retrofit to 1991-35 epic data, which in Southern California is nearly useless because of the amount of shift and uncertainty that it has in, in and of itself. And so he'll take data for days, uh, try to get an agreement with his 1991.35 epic core stations and he'll have no choice no choice but to solve for scale and rotation um in a network that held together as well as this one did i don't see any reason to but it certainly is a tool for when you come up against a factor um you know when you look at your error factors even in the the unconstrained adjustment um, if it's if they're just really big and you just have trouble trouble whittling them down, um, sometimes when you go to a scale and rotate, um, it it will help. It will help fit the control that you're trying to hold fixed. So the scenario you brought up is correct. Not only he, but all of the consultants who are providing surveys on most of these Caltrans projects, at least in the districts that I've worked for, the 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 projects are to be done in 1991. Three, 0.35. So this is something you have to be involved in. But I think he would also argue that, you know, our orbits and our actual observations are being done, done in WDS84. So he would say to best fit a NAT83 constraint, which we're using, you should also do a transformation in that case, even though it's a very, very small amount. Yeah, I, I mean, I could be compelled to, to, to think that way. Um, it, it, like I said, if I, it's, a, it's in my back pocket, if I have stuff that really, really seems to be warped, you know. I think that's the key. I'm not doing it every day. I'm just asking yeah. the question is what your thoughts yeah. are about it. I'm certainly yeah. not doing it every day. Agreed. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. I got one last one for you. So all no, the I extra can, stations. I can, uh, I can hear the ice in the tray. <laughs> <laughs> all the extra stations that aren't constrained. Um, do you sometimes uh, segregate that information to see if it really has an impact uh, a no noticeable impact on your results. I will say that when I started with GPS, I was thinking of things as a network and braced quadrilaterals and, oh, it must make it stronger because it goes this direction. But I've come to, to learn from others that I should be thinking differently. I should be thinking about statistical, statistical confidence and really repeat measurement and not making a network. So I would argue just, just wild guess that three, five, seven, six, seven, nine, and six, seven, eight, throwing those in really do not have an impact on your survey. Um, they are redundant because they they're are the same observation. And so what we, what we do to, to check that and make sure that's really working out is, and I'm sure you do this too, but in TBC, we would just grab all those lines from those stations and bring them in as separate files. And then you could see just by turning those off and do provisionals, what really happened in the survey. I'll, I often do that. Um, I, I do run multiple TBC sections to segregate out the different sets of baselines I want to to work. Um, th this this job went exceptionally well, and the control only took two days. Um, oftentimes, we'll be doing control for the better part of a week, and so I'll run a TBC session for each day worth of data. And sometimes within that parameter, I'll run. Just as you said, Rich, I'll, I'll segregate out the stuff that's extra and the stuff that I know I'm going to hold fixed and, and I'll see how it works. I'll see how it applies. I have found in general that, that this tactic uh, just gives me uh, a, a lot of confidence 
and the ability to weed out bad data. If I have a couple of crummy baselines uh, in and around the, the, you know, the data with these redundant baselines and Starnet loves redundancy. I got hammered on this at Johnson and Frank, mainly by Frank, that Starnet loves redundancy. And so kind of taking some of Roger Frank's influence and some of Jay Satlish's influence and, and putting it together, th this has been a very successful scenario. So um, yeah, I, I, I do segregate the data out. I just wanted to keep it to a minimum here today and, and not get too far off into the, into the weeds. That's good stuff. <laughs> Need to get you two on just to back and forth a topic, another topic. <laughs> Lots of good stuff. It's all good. Uh, well, this is I this know, is great I, stuff. I mean, just getting samples yeah. from you know JFA, Roger Frank, uh, just that's how I learned how to do this. And so some of the things that he, that Tony's talking about, segregating the data and whatever, I learned that just by observing what others were doing and. Uh, well, and, and your guys' conversation is exactly why Mentoring Mondays was started for that live Q&A back and forth, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's awesome. Um, in the chat, Sean Lehan had a, was curious why TBC over Starnet or vice versa. Oh, yeah. Personal preference or is it just, well, I, why, why, why do you like Starnet more so than TBC? Because when I started doing network adjustments, nobody even knew how to spell TBC. Um, it was spelled TGO. And so, yeah, TGO um, or Geostar, <laughs> one of the most user hostile yeah. programs ever conceived. Um, yeah. And it was the DOS version, you know? Um, and so, I mean, I, I literally started on Starnet with serial number two of the, of the production run when we bought this in 1988. And it was $55. Um, it's a little <laughs> different now, but it's, it's just, it's just, it's what I'm used to. Um, like I said, I use TBC sparingly uh, just to get my data into Starnet. Um, and so. Um, uh, and that was, that was the, the follow-up question to that. And so what part of, of TBC are you using? Yeah, I'll, I'll process the baselines. I'll, I'll bring in the, the, I'll bring in the TO2 files, um, create a, a, a regional data set of, of UNAVCO, um, uh, cores locations, uh, process out to those, um, and 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 do some very very broad scale weeding of data um, in TBC because if it shows up in TBC, it's going to show up in Starnet too, um, uh, you know. And then I'll you'll notice that the network doesn't have any connectivity between the cores locations. I'll take those baselines out and then just export the baselines I'm going to use as Rich brought up, segregate the data day by day, segregate the data classification by classification, run multiple TBC processing sessions to get my data into data files that I can build in, in a, a network with and troubleshoot very easily. Because once you get it here, it's, it's hard to do that anymore. It's really only easy to do in TBC. It's one big spaghetti mess, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. Gotcha. Perfect. Anybody else? That was a great discussion. I loved it. Hey, Tony, you, one thing I missed from TBC, and I, I used to do adjustments in TBC, is they have really nice bell curve histograms, you know, graphic plots. And that's been something I've been putting on the wish list. And I don't know if you think we're ever going to see that in Starnet. It's always going to be only text based outputs. Yeah. I, I, we, used to, we used to see that in, Geo, in Ge, Geolab. What did I say? Geostar. Geolab. I I saw in GP survey, I think was the first before TGO that I used. Yeah, but that's, I haven't seen that in a long, long time. Yeah. Those can be useful because it gives you a, a sense of the network as well to see how the residuals are, are lay, lining up. Yeah, well, you, when you see it statistically and then apply it geographically, sometimes you can troubleshoot very quickly. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Anybody else? Trent. I think we're good. <laughs> I think oh, that's I it. A quick question. Ah, there you go. Go. Sorry. Um, right when you're about to get out, right? <laughs> oh, you're fine. Go for it. Um, so we are starting to incorporate Starnet into our workflow. Where we've been mainly TBC before this. Um, so I'm learning Starnet. Um, I was curious, um, how much time would you guys estimate you spend, um, playing? I say playing with the data in Starnet. I don't. I think that's probably the right term, but <laughs> no, that's a that's a good that's a good question. When I put together a project budget, 
I, I put together usually, uh, you know, depending on the perceived complexity, an hour or two a day for data processing and reductions and analysis per day of field work. So if the guys are going to go out there on a big job, um, you know, let's look at this ALTA I was talking about. It's, it's 4,600 acres. There's six weeks worth of field work collecting data for aerial panels and boundary points. I'll put two hours a day on that, and I'll put two hours a day for 33 days um, because that's what it takes to manage an archive and, anal and, and, and analyze uh, you know, the data. So an hour or two a day per day of field time spent taking measurements that you're going to have to analyze is, is pretty legitimate. For an expert user, so a begin user would <laughs> for the... <laughs> <laughs> I did yeah, start I, some I, of my time to training, so. <laughs> I, I ditched the training wheels before most of you were born, so yes. <laughs> uh, one consideration for a firm has that the field employees can work in the office like ours, um, that they're actually responsible for all the preliminary review of their own work. They bring it into Starnet, download it, check it, it, you know, once the project's rolling, maybe we've got some constraints in there for already for them. But so the way I'm budgeting it normally is a field crew's got an hour a day to bring their data in, check it, just like everything else to bring it in their level notes or GPS, everything and putting it in there. And then, I mean, of course, project sizes vary, but I'm typically, or another person is not in that project for more than four, four hours, to, even to, independent of the size really, but there's a minimum to get in there. I mean, you're gonna be there two or three hours just going through everything anyways. And then maybe the largest projects might have four to six hours or something like that. But but like Tony said, every day, someone has to get that data in there and check and make sure that it's working out. We just have pushed that down to the field party chief level. Yeah, excellent. And that, and that really broadens the base of who can contribute to the project, which is tremendous. And, and how much do your field guys, I mean, you've, you know, like people like Mark Platt, field guys who know how to use Starnet, how much do they do a better job in the field understanding what's happening in the office? Exactly. We're, 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 we're giving them the fishing pole instead of buying them the fish. Wait. Anybody else? Quiet? Quiet. Gosh, you're quiet tonight. It'd be the good. first time I've seen Leaf Adams in something where he doesn't have something to say. <laughs> Come on, Leaf. <laughs> I guess not. Hey, Trent, again, <laughs> thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I really believe in what you're doing here. Thank you, sir. And, you know, whether you're people like us, whether we're speaking to the choir or, or, or really speaking to people who have diverse, uh, you know, opinions on how to do things. That's what makes us better as a profession. And I, I just want to say thanks. No, I appreciate it. And then uh, one parting question. How about uh, we're trying to build our little survey library book on the website. So your favorite book. My favorite book, Shooting Polaris. Okay. Um, it's a book. Uh, you know what? I'm sorry I don't have the author, but it is, a, it is the most metaphysical survey book anyone could ever want to read. It is. It was written by a professor at at uh, Cal State Fresno, and he was an English professor, I think, but he worked in the mid 70s on a BLM crew doing original surveys. And it's, a, it's an amazing survey book that's not really a survey book, but <laughs> I think every surveyor should read it because it's, it's, a, it's a very poetic book. It's written beautifully. And, um, and I think we, you, you, everybody in this, in this profession can relate to that. Shooting Polaris. Awesome. Okay. There yeah, you go. Sweet. All right, guys. Anything else before we sign off? Good job, Tony. Thanks. Yeah, that Thanks, was awesome. Good, good to see you. Rob, take care. Trent, okay. Thanks, thank guys. you again, buddy. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys. Great to see you, Tony. Thanks, everybody. Take thank care, you guys. Everybody. Thank you for showing up. Thanks, Bye. Trent. You're Pleasure. an awesome guy. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>